please a warm round of applause for the one and only Mr. Jules Shear. Wow. Okay. How about that, Jules? You come out every, uh, you're like a groundhog. You come out every uh, six years or so, and uh, the fans greet you. And they applaud? And they applaud, well, and they right. cheer. Yeah, I like it. It's going to go all downhill from here, but okay. we'll, 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 we'll see what we can do. Is this the closest you've ever become to a, to a Grammy? Is this? Uh, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it's the closest I've come. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just thought I'd, you know. Oh, Take you below the belt for, yeah, for once. Fun. Grammys don't mean anything to you. I mean, uh, sales. I, I mean, you have, uh, you have really defied expectations with your career, haven't you? <laughs> have I? Well, uh, I don't know. I, I got to say, Grammys don't mean that much to me, but uh, <laughs> that doesn't matter. No, we're, we're here and we're, right. we're above ground, and uh, you are having um, almost like a second lease on life now in terms of, uh, uh, I mean, your solo career is, is so eclectic. You've gone all over the place. Uh, you know, you, you're with the Funky Kings and, and Jules and the Polar Bear, uh, two bands that um, are, are sort of ultimate kind of um, insider bands. But a as I was saying before up in the green room, you've really kind of been ahead of your time with what you've tried to do. Um, you know, I, I mean, uh, the Funky Kings were sort of uh, country-flavored rock before that was big. Uh, Jules and the Polar Bears with Stephen Haig. You had a lot of keyboard-oriented stuff, synthesizer-oriented stuff. Um, do you ever feel like uh, you've kind of lost out on the trends <laughs> or, no. or anticipated trends that happened after you already had gone through them? No, I've never considered that. <laughs> I knew this was going to go there like this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's the way it is. Uh, I never really thought about how any of it related to anything. I just did it. You just did it. Um, I just wrote songs. I just continued to write songs. That's what I do. Uh, that's what I started out doing. And that's what I continue to do, write songs. And anything that happens as a result of that is great. But... Uh, uh, I'm not really trying to do any of that stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, okay, this is your life, Jules Shearer. Oh. We're, we're going to take you all the way back now to... These uh, people came to hear music, right? They, they did. They don't want to hear this talk? I don't know. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> you do? <laughs> music or talk? <laughs> okay, both. Let's you hear got about it. you. You got it. You okay. Got it. Okay, that's fine. We're not going to give this up five minutes in, no, are no, we? No, no, <laughs> no. As, lo as, lo as long as I know that they really want to hear it. Okay. Uh, well, uh, let's... Uh, you grew up in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, you, you had two brothers. What, uh, what were the sounds that you grew up with? What, what are the first sounds of music that you heard? What turned you on to music early on? Uh, I guess the Beatles, you know. I guess uh, there were two stations in Pittsburgh... Uh, AM stations, there was KQV and there was KDKA, which was an early station, which was uh, one of the big stations, really, uh, in the early days of rock music. But KQV was sort of a mainstream top 40 station, whereas KDKA played a lot of weird stuff, which I really loved. So I would listen to that station more than any, and... Uh, and really got into hearing stuff and wondered where did this stuff come from? Where did, where did this come from? And uh, I just continued to really enjoy that, that music more than anything. When you say offbeat, what, uh, I, I mean, what do you remember from hearing back then? What was sort of a, uh, an, yeah. uh, an example of an unusual song that uh, caught your ear? Uh, maybe like a... A song by Rod McEwen or something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> something where it was like, "Who is this guy? Where did this come from?" You know, and uh, and I would listen to it and think it was maybe not great. Maybe I would think it was great. I don't know. Uh, I don't know why I even thought of Rod McEwen. I don't know. 
But there you go. Well, I, I mean, the guy was a poet, so he was a lyricist. I thought you were going to say, We're everybody's thinking of Rod McEwen. Jules, course, face it. <laughs> uh, Frankly, I haven't thought of Rod McEwen well, in a long time. Well, there you time, go. I'm telling uh, you. I'm telling you. I don't know why he popped into my head. I don't know why we're spending all this time discussing him. But there you go. Okay. Was performing your first impulse? I mean, I know you were at the, uh, in the choir, the Glee Club at Pittsburgh. You yeah. formed an offshoot called Wooden Music, where you first began to play acoustic guitar, which yeah. uh, um, you know beca you've become associated with over the years. Were you a? Um, did you see yourself as a performer at first? No, I didn't really. I, I don't know what I saw myself as, but uh, me and my two older brothers were all in the Glee Club at University of Pittsburgh. And for one year, I think we were both, we were all in there. And uh, that was just fun for me. And, and then they started this thing where they did the second half was more, second half of the show was more informal. And so you could uh, come up with stuff. And what I came up with was a folk group, kind of, and we performed as part of that, and it was really, I thought it was really fun, you know. I, and we did a couple of my songs, but we did mostly cover versions of songs. I don't know what we did. I don't remember what songs we did. Were you writing that early? Yeah. And what, uh, I mean, how were you writing? Were you um, writing on acoustic guitar? Were you writing song lyrics first, or did yeah. you come up with melodies? Uh, yeah, it was mostly... Uh, it was mostly just, I was just writing songs and I wasn't thinking about why I was doing it. I was just doing it. And so uh, I would just write a bunch, a bunch of them. And I had a tape recorder and I would uh, record them all so I could remember them. And I had that and uh, I just loved writing them. That's, that's what I really loved the most. Mm -hmm. um, the process of, of writing... Um, you don't seem to be self-conscious about it. I mean, several times that we've talked about your writing process, um, you don't like to explain what the songs mean or what they're about. You keep claiming you don't know what they're about. Um, <laughs> do I do that? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what, what is the process? I mean, how do you get into that headspace where, you know, you can write purely and, and not have to be self-conscious about it? Well, I would start with words, and I would write words, maybe, I don't know, 10 lines, 12 lines, and they would have no music in them whatsoever. They would just be strictly words, and I would just write these words. Okay, so that, that would be done. And then I would probably do it again. I would do it again over and over again until I had maybe, I don't know, a half dozen of them or something, and then... Uh, Take them one at a time and just go, okay, that first one's going to be tomorrow morning. That's what I'm going to start on. And I go out to the room, my writing room, and I sit there and try to pound that into a song. And it's fun. So it's a process. Uh, I mean, yeah. uh, it doesn't happen spontaneously. It sounds like it well, takes Well, it can happen spontaneously, yeah. sure. Uh, it, amid, amidst all that stuff, yeah, 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 it does happen spontaneously. That's what I like. I like when it, when it just happens, whew, and there it is. And it wasn't there before, and there, and there, and there it is. Mm -hmm. um, from Pittsburgh now, you moved. Uh, you never finished school at Pittsburgh, right? Did you Don't graduate? rub it in, man. Come on. <laughs> Look what you've done without a diploma. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I went three years in the University yeah. of Pittsburgh, and yes. then I, went, I came out here. And you came out to L.A.? You formed a band. She, yeah, shortly after that, I was in L.A. for, I don't know, how long I was here, maybe a year or something like that, before I came up with, oh, with the Funky Kings you're yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. long was it before you formed the Funky Kings? Well, first of all, I wouldn't say I formed the Funky mm -hmm. Kings, but uh, it was probably, I don't know, a couple years, I guess, I don't know. And the Funky Kings were basically Jack Temption, yeah, who uh, wrote for the Eagles, "Peaceful Easy Feel," uh, "Peaceful Easy Feeling," yeah, and uh, and also and "Already Gone" was also Jack's already song. "Already Gone," and yeah. uh, and a gentleman named Richard Steckel. Yeah, Richard. And uh, was it in? It's one of the best songwriters in the world. And you were all writing material for th for the band. Yeah, we all wrote. Uh, that's right. And I ended up with. Uh, 
whatever, three songs on that record, and I was fine with it because that's the way that's the way it was going. That that was cool. That was fine with me. And so uh, we did that. We did. Uh, we wanted to make a second record, and Clive Davis didn't want us to make no second record. <laughs> Did you butt heads with uh, Clive? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, hey yeah. Clive, we're we're uh, in your theater now. You can say whatever you oh, want. Yeah, yeah. We went through a lot of stuff with Clive. It was crazy with Clive. So Who this was this was 1976. It was kind of the uh, sort of the middle of the singer songwriter period, the beginning of of punk and and new wave, and. Um, there was, uh, so one album came out, the second was never released. But one of the songs from the first album, uh, So Easy so easy to Begin, eventually covered by Olivia Newton-John. Olivia Newton-John recorded that song, that's true. Was that the first big kind of cover that you, that you had as a uh, songwriter? Uh, no, that was uh, one of the first ones, but it wasn't Severin Brown was the guy who recorded the first cover of one of my songs. That's Jackson's brother, and he's a wonderful guy. Uh, and uh, Severin was the one who said, I, I've got to do this song on my record. I said, great, you got a record? That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. And uh, he was on Motown. A white guy on Motown? Yeah. Now that's unusual. It was unusual at the time. I remember thinking, it's very strange, but maybe they're going to try to do something. <laughs> Who cares? He wants to record the song. It, <laughs> it can't ever hurt you if somebody wants to record the song, right? Is that when, right? Uh, absolutely. It hasn't hurt you, has oh, it? Oh, no. That it someone's covered your song? No, I wondered if you knew of a, another <laughs> no thing way. I should be worried about. No, no it's way. Okay. okay. Um, let's talk about the band that came after that. Uh, Jules and the Polar Bears. Yeah. Can you talk about? Uh, <laughs> I, well, I mean, uh, well, thank you. The persistence of that band is incredible. I mean, uh, you know, I, I mean, still fans to this day. What uh, What were you trying to do there? You had yeah, what uh, the hell were you trying? Yeah, to you, you had <laughs> you had Stephen Haig playing keyboards, the guy who went on to practically invent UK, you know, techno rock with New Order. Uh, Pet Shop Boys, Erasure, OMD. Uh, you were at Columbia Records at the time. Yes, that's correct. And uh, what was the story? How did that band come about? What was the thought with it? Uh, the band came about. Why did the band come apart? Well, mo mostly come about, not come apart. Uh, why? Oh, that's a different <laughs> question. Okay. Uh, Stephen Haig and I uh, wanted to do this band, and Stephen knew the other people. And so uh, we tried it. It was uh, Richard Bordice and David Beebe, and uh, it was it was a great band. I mean, it, it was really fun to be in that band, and uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I wrote all the songs, and so that was really fun for me. And um, yeah, we had a rocking band. And uh, being a grammarian myself, I, I love the title of the second album, Phonetics. Spelled phonetically. What was <laughs> another example of your wry humor? What was that about? <laughs> I, 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 don't, I guess I was just being wry. I don't <laughs> know what the fuck it was. I don't know why I did that. Not R Y E W R Y. Wry. Okay. Wry. I knew it wasn't <laughs> rye bread. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Third album. Yeah. That never, that never came out. Um, uh, dubbed aptly bad for business. Yeah, and it was dubbed that before when when they didn't want to put it out. <laughs> when Columbia didn't want to put it out. You just gave them an excuse not I to put it out. I just called it bad for business. <laughs> so that's what it's called. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they didn't want to do it, so that's okay. Uh, they did end up putting it out a number of years later. Uh, yeah, it came out in 1996. Oh, you know that. I know huh? that. In CD, yeah. And... Uh, yeah, that was fun. That was a really fun record to make. They were all fun to make, I'm sure. Uh, probably Phonetics was really fun because that was me and Steven together, and that was, uh, we didn't have another producer, so it was really 
uh, dependent upon us. And uh, it was um, Peter Philbin was the guy at Columbia Records who... The A&R guy, yeah. Yeah, who said, yeah, go ahead and do it. So that was, that was great. And then that's how we made the third record as well, which didn't really... Didn't really come out. Didn't see the light of day. Didn't see the light. Of day. Where was that? Uh, were you in L.A. still, or was this, uh, or, or had you been to Woodstock at this point? No, no, no. I was in L.A. Still in L.A. with Jules and Paul Day. All right. So now let's take it to uh, let, let's go into your solo career a little bit. Right. And uh, at this point, we're in about 1983. Are you sure everybody wants to come along? Though? Do you want to come along on this voyage? Uh, okay. Never enough jewels. Never oh, enough. Oh man. Okay. You, you could want. say this is like jewels before swine, couldn't you, uh, if you wanted to? <laughs> All right. I, I'll, enough of the humor. I will. Um, let's talk about Watchdog because it was an interesting record. Your solo debut, 1983. Okay. Produced by Todd, and you told me you worked at Minkala. Todd. He just goes by one Todd, name. Todd. Todd. Yes. Todd Rundgren. Okay. Okay. Uh, Todd Rundgren, <laughs> Minkala up in Bearsville. Yeah. Um, you had an incredible kind of cast with this. Uh, Elliot Easton of the Cars, who you worked with uh, in the future, and Tony Levin, the bass player uh, with the stick. And uh, several of these songs on this record, uh, well, at least one of them, Alison Moyer, Whispering Your Name, became a hit for her. But uh, uh, talk through, about... All Through the Night was also on that album. Oh, all Through the Night was on, uh, was on Watchdog. Right, right, of course, those two. Um... Tell me about the making of that album and, um, you know, how it was different for you um, working as a solo artist with your own name on it. Well, first of all, it went really quickly with Todd. Things went really fast. Uh, he wanted to do everything really fast. Uh, we recorded the whole, s whole album from start to finish, including the mixes. Uh, it took less than two weeks, as far as I can remember. Uh, but... I liked being in Woodstock. I thought, oh, this is a cool place. I really like Woodstock. And I didn't really care about what Todd was doing with the record. If he wanted to do something with it, that's cool. But I didn't really care what he wanted to do with it. He just did it. He was going to do it anyhow. <laughs> so it was better if I didn't care very much. What was the method for you? Did you come into that album with, with songs already written? Uh, did you write in the studio? What was the process? Yeah, I wrote, I had all the songs written. I had a bunch of songs, and Todd listened to all the songs and decided which ones he thought should be on the record. And I said, that's all fine with me. Let's do them all. And he said, uh, okay. And I wrote one song while I was there. That was called I Know, I Know, I think it was called. And uh, that was the only song that was... Uh, written in Woodstock. Everything was written before that in Boston. Does that matter? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I think it matters. Okay. It matters to me. Um, uh, let's skip over to the, uh, the Eternal Return, um, which is interesting for the fact that it contains the original version of If She Knew What She Wants, um, and it also contained the version of Steady, which was a co-write with Cindy, which was your only solo hit as a as a solo artist yes i think so i don't know. yeah i think it was yeah um I, I was curious about um if she if she knew what she wants that's chromatically incorrect isn't it <laughs> if you say it is, it <laughs> is. No, I, I mean what's interesting about it is it's sort of a, an awkward kind of sentence if she knew what she wants shouldn't it be if she knew what she wanted no, it's if she knew what she <laughs> wants. <laughs> That's what it's called. That's now, what it says on the, on the copyright. <laughs> when Cindy recorded it... Um, no, Cindy, oh, no, I'm sorry, when the Bangles recorded yeah. it. I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. When the Bangles recorded it, they changed it from um, first person to third person. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't know what they did. They probably changed it. How and and uh, how do you feel when you've done a song and then someone else does it? Are, are you uh, are you able to kind of give up the ownership of this? I mean, how does that how does that begin to feel 
when other people take the song and take their own liberties with it. Yeah, anybody can do anything they want with it. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't You're matter. not precious about it. If they wanted to do the reggae version of If She Knew What She Wants, that would be fine with me. I, that'd be interesting. Uh, anything that anybody wants to do with any song is totally okay. I figured that out early on in my songwriting career, and uh, it didn't matter to me at all how anybody changed anything. Uh, like all through the night, uh, Cindy yeah. recorded it in a, in a different key, uh, sort of made it a ballad. Um, it yeah, was well a little different. she's got a higher voice than me. That's you? right. So she had to sing it in a different key. Yeah. And and also the arrangement was very different. That's that's true. You sang on that on that version on the album. I did. I did. Uh, Rick Chertoff was the guy who produced that record. And he asked me if I'd come in and sing. And I said, sure, I'll, I'd be happy to sing. But then the weird thing was that when I went in to sing the song in the studio in New York, um, I got to the chorus where I was supposed to sing. And I said, you know, Cindy's singing the harmony part. Why is she singing the harmony part? And Rick said, because she thought that was the melody. <laughs> she thought that was the lead, yeah. Yeah. And I said, oh, Okay, I guess it is now. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Fine. And you just filled in? Yeah, I just filled in the other parts, yeah. <laughs> that was cool with me. I didn't care. Uh, and then you ended up um, co-writing with Cindy later on? No, Did you write no, no. together? Uh, when, when Rick decided that the song was going to be uh, recorded by her, he thought he really believed in the song. I thought that was great. And... Uh, my manager at the time, Michael Lembo, played it for him. Uh, and um, Rick thought it was great. And he said, wow, well, well, we're, we're going to do this. We'll, we'll do this song. That's fine. But Cindy wanted to um, co-write something. So I got together with her and uh, at Mike's place, Mike's apartment in New York. And uh, we just started... Uh, coming up with stuff, and uh, instead he was one of those songs. So that was all before she ever recorded anything, and before anybody really knew she was, except for uh, she was in that band called, uh, do you know what that is? Oh, yeah. Uh, Blue Angel, Blue thank Angel. you. I was with Polydor when that record came out, yeah. Yeah, Blue Angel. And uh, and then she, uh, oh, you're a big Cindy Lauper fan, is that it? Who said that? Who, said, who knew Blue? Lemma. Oh, Lemma. <laughs> yeah, I get it. He's a ringer. Ringer. Yeah. Uh, so what was the question? I'm sorry. Uh, I forgot the question. But oh, we were fine. talking about you and Cindy writing together. Yeah, it was fine writing with Cindy. Uh, it was a little wacky, you know? She, she's just a wacky person. That's okay. Do you like the collaborative process? Or, or no, would you, you, no, you no, no, yeah, no. Yeah, you, you prefer to be alone in the room yeah. writing. I, I got you. Even dragging him out like this looks like torture to me. That's the way it goes. <laughs> you get pretending. what you pay for. <laughs> Let, let's skip ahead a little bit. I, I mean, uh, we're, yeah, we're going to pass the reckless sleepers moving. where you worked with Uncle Floyd's brother. And uh, let's, <laughs> you reckless sleepers? Well, you had a song on there, I interesting, um, if, we I never, like it too. if We Never Meet Again, yes. uh, a song that um, um, uh, Tommy, Tommy Comwell and the Young Rumblers covered, and also Roger McGinn from The Birds covered that song. That's true. Uh, what, what did you want me to tell you about? I don't know. It was, the only song, it was the only song that I had for that album by myself, because I decided that Reckless Sleepers was going to be a thing where... Uh, we were going to write all the songs together in a room, not the words, but the music part. Mm -hmm. So uh, we got a rehearsal room, and we were in New York, and we would just get together and try to write stuff. And these were guys who didn't have like a lot of writing credits or anything, but it was really fun. We really enjoyed it, and it was it was cool as long as there wasn't any words in it the, <laughs> to bother me. And then when they when we got that done, we, we would get the music done, and then I would write the words afterwards. And it was, 
it was a fun process. I enjoyed Reckless Sleepers a lot. That you liked. You seem to keep coming back to band situations. Um, did you enjoy the band situation? Was it worthwhile for you? Uh, you're talking about the band, the band well, situation, yeah, the band, not yeah, the, the bands band that you've been band. involved. Yeah, the band. No, not the band. We'll talk about that in a second. But okay. the band situations that you were involved in. Yeah, I liked having a band. It was fun. But after a while, I stopped having bands too. You know, uh, it just seemed like that was not really in the cards anymore. So I started just writing songs and making solo records. Um, Let's talk about a sort of uh, an interesting period in your life, uh, uh, probably little known, but... If um, you can find one, let's talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> MTV's Unplugged. Oh. Tell me about how you came up, uh, you know, how you came up with the concept. Yeah. Uh, I know you uh, hosted at least the first season of it. Yeah. And um, how did you come up with it? What, what, what ended up happening? Yeah. How did you lose the gig? Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I made this album for IRS, which was Re Reckless Sleepers were on this uh, label, and uh, and I wanted to make, I was writing a lot of songs on acoustic guitar, and I thought, well, I want to make an acoustic guitar record. So I thought, I asked them if I could do that as part of my deal with them. And they said, uh, well, OK. So I, I went and did it with uh, Marty Wilson Piper, who was the guitar player in the church at the time. And uh, Marty and I just did this thing. <laughs> uh, we went to Stockholm. And uh, in Stockholm, we went to a studio. And just the two of us, we made a record. It was just acoustic guitar and vocals, right? Yeah, that's right. And um, and I really enjoyed the process and everything, and it was really uh, fine with me. I didn't expect it to really sell a lot, but I wanted to make this thing, so I made it, and uh, and there it was. But then I thought, well, how are we going to promote this record? And uh, the way that we came up with was a show by which people would perform with acoustic instruments and maybe I would get in there and do something at the end or do something with them or sing with them or I could do a song of mine, whatever it was. And so that's that was the concept behind, uh, my concept behind MTV Unplugged. The first season, which we did, uh, it was maybe, I don't know how many shows it was, 12, 13, I don't know, 14? and. Uh, who okayed the project? Was it Abby Conowich who was at MTV at the time? I don't know, Mike. Was it Abby Conowich? <laughs> Who's guilty? We'll get to the bottom of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that concept absolutely exploded. Uh, and I mean, uh, Eric Clapton records, Grammys, etc. W was there ever a feeling that, uh, you know, the, the one that you let get away or anything <laughs> like that? That I did something or? right? <laughs> was there a concept of that? No, there was no concept of that. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, we just did the shows. And I was mostly the guy who said, here's what's their name. And I did that a lot. <laughs> I said, I said uh, here's Sinead, here's the church, here's nah. and. Uh, everybody was on it. That's what I both basically did. And then I got to sing with them sometimes, and that was really fun. Got to sing a song with who the two guys from Squeeze on the first show that we ever did. Uh, we did some stuff together, and it was really fun. So I thought, oh, this can be really fun. I really enjoyed this. So, uh, so I kept trying to do that. And sometimes it would be good, and sometimes Don Handley would be on, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Anyone taping this? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was wry, Jules. <laughs> oh. Uh, Don Henley, just to be clear about this, wanted to do an unplugged show that had full orchestration, and uh, he wanted to be unplugged but he wanted to use a few things that were plugged and that <laughs> bass or something like that that was really plugged. And I thought it was kind of cool to have it be intimate, 
But he was such a big star at that point, and everybody said, you've got to let him do it. You've got to let him. So he did it, and, uh, and that was cool. I, I don't even care. I, was, I would get to say, here's Don Henley, <laughs> and that would be my <laughs> part of the whole show. That would be my contribution. Don Henley, unplugged, unplugged. <laughs> And but it, it was fine, you know, whatever, whatever anybody wanted to do. I felt that there was, should be nothing plugged in, and there was. So I was a little the weird purest about in that. you was offended. Well, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I figure well, you got to draw a line somewhere, and that's where it is. If you wanted to be people to be playing on a stage, then it wouldn't be unplugged. So it just wouldn't be. So, but people disagreed. So whatever. <laughs> Uh, one other thing I, I, I want to bring up, which I found interesting, and, and I worked on this with you um, uh, a couple of years ago, and that was your experience uh, writing with the members of the band, um, or the remaining re members of the band after Richard Manuel and, uh, and Robbie were no longer part of it. Uh, I know it was set up by Rick Chertoff um, at the time, and um, were you in Woodstock at that at that Point. Yeah, I lived in Woodstock, yeah. And he sent you over to uh, someone's house. Was it LeVon's house or no, something? No, it was, it was like a, 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 a sor sort of a, a barn kind of place where people rehearsed. And, uh, yeah, they sent me over there. And I didn't, I didn't know. You know, I didn't know. I didn't really s meet the bit guys in the band before this. I hadn't really, didn't really know if it was really what the right thing to do would be. But I knew I liked the band, so I thought it would be fun. So I went over to this place, and I knocked on the door, and nobody answered. And I was standing there going, oh, man, here I am. In the middle of the Woodstock night, it was beautiful. Uh, but nobody was answering the door. So I thought, OK, I'll leave. That's good. So. <laughs> That'll give me a good excuse. I'll say, Rick, <laughs> nobody, an <laughs> so nobody answered the no, door. What can you do? You can't write anything if nobody answers the door. <laughs> but then Levon came to the door, and he said, um, yeah. And I said, well, uh, Rick Chertoff sent me over here. <laughs> I thought I felt like a dope, totally. Uh, Rick Chertoff sent me over to write a song. So stupid. I felt so stupid. <laughs> and... Uh, and Levon immediately said, well, come on in. <laughs> like, like it was the uh, happiest time. Everybody was really enjoying themselves. And I thought, OK, great, cool. So I went in, and all those guys were around, all the guys who were playing with the band now or then. And, uh, and plus, Rick Danko was there. And uh, so it was Rick Danko and Levon and Garth were the guys, the original guys who were around. And they were all. Fantastic! I thought they were all totally great. Uh, I particularly got along with Rick. Uh, you co-wrote with him, didn't you, eventually? Yes, I did. I, I wrote wrote a couple songs with him that was on the one called the Healing Bones. Healing Bones. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Some real fans out there, huh? Just because they know the name of an album? <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah. I, uh, it was I cool. think that qualifies. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he, uh, it was good. It was good uh, writing with Rick. Just being around Rick was good. I just liked the whole deal. Um, but w I, I think I co-wrote. I mostly wanted to co-write. I didn't want to give him songs. I wanted to write songs with the band. And so um, we started doing that. And... Uh, and I don't know how many I wrote. I don't know how many, like eight or ten or something like that. And they ended up recording two, I think. And why, I, I just don't know. But uh, whatever. It was, uh, they were they were really fun to hang around with at the rehearsals. And it was really fun to write the songs. And the songs turned out kind of good. Uh, the one song I thought turned out really good was the one uh, called Too Soon Gone. And that song... Uh, for Richard, right? Yeah, it was for Richard. But I didn't know Richard. So Stan Celeste, right. who was the keyboard player who took over mm -hmm. from Richard in the band, he wanted to write this thing. And he showed it to me. He showed me the little bit in the middle and uh, the, uh, the bridge. 
And I thought, oh, that's nice. And I put it on tape, and I thought, okay. And there were a bunch of other ones too, though, so I didn't really know whether I'd get along with that or not. But I did. I did start to write that one, and it turned out, I thought, pretty good. Yeah, and that one ended up on, on Jericho, the band album. That ended up on some band album, which you know the title of, yes. and I don't know. <laughs> so, see? That was good. That was a good thing. That and then they finally came out, what? Um, I, I mean, those demos laid... I mean, nothing was done with them for a while. And then, um, who was your guy from up in Woodstock who actually... Oh, uh, Louis. Louis, yeah, Louis. Hurwitz or something? Yeah, uh, Louis. He's a guy who lives in Woodstock and... Uh, He's like a band aide, factotum, whatever. I guess so. I guess he was an engineer kind of mm -hmm. guy and he's done things on his own as, as uh, Professor Louis and the right. Chromatics, right, right, right. which... Uh, I guess Rick gave them their titles. And their, so. so anyway, uh, yeah, we, he decided he wanted to record those songs because he knew those songs right. and thought they were great, and he just wanted to make sure there was some recording of them, so he just did that, and that just came out recently. Okay, um, we're going to do a Q&A in a second. Uh, I, I just wanted to pre preface. What is this if it's not a Q&A? This is a Q&A. We're going to let, do, do anyone have questions in the audience for, for Jules? Yeah. Yeah? I, I just wanted to mention one one other, um, your most recent album, uh, the, uh, the the One More Crooked Dance, yeah. which uh, is, is interesting because it eschews guitar, bass, and drums all together. Um, is basically just piano and harp and, and a very stark sort of look at a... Uh, Keeping the sparks alive in a, in a long-term romance is the way we described it. But um, tell me about this latest set of songs and what was the inspiration? Well, I was just writing a bunch of songs. I didn't have any idea why. Uh, I didn't know until I finished writing a bunch of songs. I, I thought, uh, maybe there's an album here. Maybe th there's a, a record to do. And I thought I would do it uh, at an, a place in Woodstock where a friend of mine had this studio, and uh, we just decided to do it there. And it, it turned out, I think it turned out pretty good, but it was once again like the thing that spawned Unplugged. It was like more uh, sparse, and I don't know. I don't know whether people relate to it or not. I don't know. I know I related to it, so there it goes. But uh, it was it a... Was, uh, a fun time recording the record, and I enjoyed it, but, uh, and that's all I know about it. Okay, let's go to the audience. I know, he, he wouldn't tell me either, but uh, <laughs> who's got a question for Jules? Oh, man, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> this is a softball for you. Uh, the name of the uh, song that set it up. Ah, it was called Romance. If you want romance, it's all right. We can kick the shit out of the night. <laughs> if you want romance, baby, let the lover in you come out. I was a kid. I was a kid. But that was the that push was and pull of love is very much a topic in uh, well, in, you in your songs. There's something it? that everybody knows about. <laughs> That's okay. Who else? Come on, don't be shy. Well, I don't really know. Uh, a song that I wish I'd have written. Uh, now, nah, I can't really say there's that. But, you know, when I was a kid, I was really into Jimmy Webb. I really liked Jimmy Webb. I really liked his songs. I really, I thought he was an excellent songwriter. His voice was something that some people couldn't handle, and some people really liked it. And... Uh, I was one of the ones who really liked it. But, um, yeah, Jimmy Webb, many of his songs, I would listen to and go, oh, man, that's really great. What he did there, that's really good. Uh, which I don't really think all that often when I listen to music. But, uh, yeah, I really liked him. Uh, but I can't really think of one particular song right now. I'm sorry. MacArthur Park? I no, left the cake out in the rain. <laughs> now, don't laugh at that, <laughs> man. I'm not laughing. 
Jimmy Webb is one of the greatest songwriters, no question. Oh, well, you can just laugh at his lyrics. No, I'm not so laughing at okay. his lyrics. Come on. I mean, you got to dare to be, uh, you know, you got to dare to write lyrics like that. That's true. I think so. I think that's so, that you have to dare. That's right. Anyone else before uh, he straps on Young his upside-down guitar? What do you want to know? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> J for Jules. What? What? Well, what? What was that? Okay. Um, well. <laughs> Compose yourself. <laughs> I'm fine with it, really. It's okay with me. Uh, <laughs> Does yeah. it help? There's, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of his girlfriends that you can ask about, too, if you Whoa. want. <laughs> I didn't say that. Uh, well, you know, I, I met Amy when I lived in Boston, and she was working at the... Uh, local record store and I was spending some time in the local record store just unrelated to her but wh when I would go in the record store I would see Amy and go God that's an incredible looking woman and uh, and that was all that it was and um, then uh, I I got to I got to know her better and uh, and she would come to New York a lot and I was living in New York and um, yeah she I, I, she struck me always struck me as being uh, a really friendly person and a really nice person and I I just I just looked at her so there's that now what was the question. Uh, uh, yeah, um, well, we, I don't think we wrote more than two songs or something together. I didn't want to write songs with her. I, I didn't want to. That wasn't what I had in mind. <laughs> so, um, <sighs> but, uh, sh I thought she was great as an artist, and I thought sh her thing, because she had Till Tuesday, that was her band. And I didn't want to get involved in the middle of their thing, you know. Uh, I didn't want to, you know, s begin to date an entire band. <laughs> uh, that would be too, too crazy. And so, uh, w that was that was it, you know. Uh, we got to be really good friends, and uh, and I would go to Boston sometimes. She would come to New York sometimes. It was really nice. Uh, and then it was over. <laughs> well, is it easy to write songs with someone you're romantically involved with or yeah, to collaborate? No, I don't think it's easy. I think it's hard. I think it's easier when you don't know them at all. What about with your current uh, wife, pal? You've uh, collaborated with her on, on several albums. You've worked together. Yeah, I have. But I, I can't really say that that's easy. Never is. <laughs> Anyone else over there? Nobody. <laughs> Ed Sheeran. We were just talking about Ed. I wasn't. You were. <laughs> I was not. I know. Uh, you know, there's some people. I don't know who they are. I don't know. I don't know. I don't really think about who else is around or my competition or any of that shit. Uh, yeah, th those were people from, you know, when I talk about Jimmy Webb or something, I talk about somebody from my childhood or something that I really love. Uh, you know, that's one thing. But someone today, if I would uh, to hear somebody and go, oh man, I wish I could write with them. I don't, I don't really feel that way. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know why, but I think I just enjoy writing by myself and not thinking about it. Uh, 
writing with anybody else. So that's generally what I do. Um, sorry, that's not a very good answer. Anybody else? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. We'll get to you, though. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Still searching, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, this gentleman had an idea for making some kind of movie about me, and I didn't know what he wanted to do, but I said, okay. Uh, he was going to set up something, a show that he was going to film, and uh, he did it. We... we filmed something, uh, but then he moved away from Los Angeles, and I don't know, I haven't heard from him too much, and it's okay with me, because it wasn't my idea to begin with, you know, he wanted to do something, and I said, okay, I'll try to help if I can, but I don't know, and it wasn't like I was out there going, <laughs> I gotta have a movie, <laughs> that's what I would really need. A Jules I Shear reality show, yeah, yeah. It wasn't really like that. Yeah, let's talk about Amy again. <laughs> You know, once the record is made and once the record is put out, I, I don't really think about it at all. And you don't listen to it either. Uh, if I have to, <laughs> but I don't really. I'm more, I'm more working on the next thing, you know. Uh, so I'm not really, I'm not really thinking about uh, what I did last time or anything. I'm not. I, I'm not really. I'm sorry. I'm not really thinking about it too much. What are you up to next? Are you thinking about uh, uh, another album? Have you started writing? What's, uh, what's the yeah, process? Yeah, I started, but just barely. I got to write some more. And so, uh, so I'm looking forward to doing that. But I'm always looking forward to doing that, to writing. That's what, that's what I really like to do. That's what I love to do. That's the thing that keeps me going. Uh, as far as anything else, I don't... I don't know what my next step is. It, it, it would really depend on what what the songs end up sounding like, what I do with them. Uh, and you don't know until you write them what they're going to be. You don't, you don't have any idea. So I'll just, uh, I just keep writing them. I don't know. He just keeps writing them. And now he's going to perform a few for us, yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah? yeah? yeah. <laughs> Jules, thank you so I'm much. <laughs> Thank you, man. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay, so what's going to happen? They're going to they're going to change everything yeah, yeah. around. Okay. You go off. Okay. We both go, go off, off, I guess. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to have Beth Thornley come up here in a little bit. What? And we're going to Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and Ed Roth is going to play piano as well. Right. Why does Ed Roth get a lot of applause? <laughs> Okay, so, but I want to I want to do something to start, but I don't know what to do. I don't know if anybody's got. Okay. 
Okay. No sense reaching down below the surface. You don't do anything except on purpose. There's no sense in me standing here shouting. There's mountains out there, just cold, cold mountains. Another place I've never been to. And these ears that you were lying in too. No sense reaching down below the surface. No one here reads maps, they just talk. It's all left at the tree, right at the rock. The little kids always wailing. State of shock, yes, I am too. All because you might show up, you might show up. second I'm gonna be all right Cause I've been watching that spider all night the spider's got nothing but time on his hands he's not worried about what fate demands no me I got your picture Somewhere else instead Give me a second I'm gonna be alright No one here reads maps They just talk It's all left at the tree Right at the rock The little kid's always wailing In a state of shock Yes, I am too. All because you might show up. You might show up. Maps, they just talk. It's all left at the tree, right at the rock. The little kids always wailing in a state of shock. Guess I am too. All because you, all because you, all because.
Thank you. Thanks. This is Ed Roth. I was telling you about him. Yeah, I did this album uh, with a guy named Peppy, and Peppy lives in Woodstock, and uh, I've known Peppy for a long time just to say hi to him. And I knew he was a piano player, but I had no idea whether he was a great piano player, a good piano player, a terrible piano player, he could have been. And uh, I ran to him one day, and I said, why don't you come over to the studio and play one of these songs and see what it sounds like. This is before I had any concept for how the record was going to go, what it was going to sound like or anything. And, uh, and Peppy said, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. So Peppy came over and played piano on a song, and I thought it sounded really great. So I said, let's do it again. Come on, let's do it again tomorrow. So we started doing it, more and more songs, and Peppy was going, yeah, I think I can play this. And I would teach him the song, and he would just do it, and it was it was really fun. So uh, then I ran to John Sebastian in town at the health food store, and John Sebastian said, uh, "What are you doing?" And I told him what I was doing. I was making this record. I said, "You know, actually, you should play on this record. You should come over, but only play harmonica." and don't play anything else. And he said, well, I just got a couple new guitars. He's a collector, and, he s and he, they're really cool. And I said, well, no, you're going to play harmonica, <laughs> and that's what all you're going to play. Just harmonica on three or four songs. I don't know, two maybe. I don't know. Let's see how it goes. Come on over. So Sebastian came over, and... Uh, you know, I was a big fan of John Sebastian. I'm still a big fan of John Sebastian. Uh, for those of you, and maybe a few of you don't know who John Sebastian is, he was the uh, main songwriter in uh, The Love and Spoonful, and also on the solo record. Uh, and I thought uh, he played really, really well on my record. Uh, and so, we got to, had those two, and we had uh, Molly Fardley, who came and sang on it, and she sounded really great. And so that was, I decided that was the re whole album right there. So why am I explaining this? Because you were on stage. That's what I'd like to know. Uh, when it came to the West Coast to play these dates, I was introduced to Ed, and uh, he can really play. Uh, so, uh, we're going to do this song from the new album. It's called uh, Painkiller. <laughs> song is meant for Caddy and the sea is meant to drown we're not talking where you want to go we're talking where you're bound I try to sort them out if they're true these promises
This painkiller does everything it even calls your name. This painkiller does everything but kill the pain. Well, I got this painkiller. It's supposed to do me good, but I swear it couldn't help me to feel better if it could. The dogs are standing at attention, but she's not coming. This painkiller does everything, it's got no shame. This painkiller does everything but kill the pain. This painkiller does everything except for what it claims. This painkiller does everything but kill the pain. Sing along through the rain. This painkiller does everything but kill the pain. Thank you. This is Beth Thornley coming up here. Um, Beth also had the uh, had the occasion to sing on this stuff, even though it had been sung on by another singer. <laughs> but uh, she does great. I'm sure you'll enjoy her. Um, uh, which song is this? Oh, I know that song. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. 
Just like the snow bank waiting just to leave the way you came. No sense taking time to explain. right It only makes sense when it's right If there's no dream to build upon I'll tell like out. 
to hear one more goodbye. It's one more memory. Okay, maybe I'm going to play a little guitar, okay? Oh, come on. <laughs> you know, on this little trip, it's really taken a, a turn where people are asking about how did you learn how to play guitar like that? <laughs> and I, I don't think I've explained it more times than I have in the last few days. It's really <laughs> crazy that people are interested in that now. But it, it's fine. But I took my oldest brother's guitar and he would go from one thing to another enjoying whatever he did when he was growing up and playing guitar was one of them he thought he wanted to do and he wanted to do it for a month or something like that and then I saw that guitar laying there and thought wow maybe I can play that thing so I started playing it and I couldn't of course because I'm left handed and he was right handed as a normal person would be <laughs> and so <laughs> I uh, I started tuning it to a chord so I tuned it to a chord and I thought oh this is great I can I can do that and it'd be really fun so I did that for a while and that worked for uh, I don't know, maybe a year or something like that before I realized that I could actually make minor chords by changing the bottom note. And so, so I started doing that and then my songwriting really kicked up a notch because I could actually play all the chords. And so that really made a big difference to me as a songwriter. And so I started writing songs and it was really got to be fun doing it that way. OK, 
okay, this song is a song I wrote because some friends of mine were in London together, and we were all in London, and uh, they said, uh, we're going to our rehearsal, our band rehearsal. I said, I'm going to stay here at the house, and I'm going to try to write something. So I felt a little bad because I was writing lots of songs at the time, but I had, hadn't been writing songs during this, this time in London. So I thought, I'll try to write something. So I, I started to, but because I wanted to so badly go out in London and see my friends and do all sorts of stuff, so I wrote it really quickly. I wrote the song in about an hour, and um, this, of course, has been my most famous song. <laughs> which I don't feel bad about. It's fine with me, but. <laughs> okay, so this is a song uh, that Cindy Lauper then recorded. time when time is new oh all through the night today knowing that we'd feel the same without sight we have no past we won't reach back back
Thank you. Thanks. I know that didn't seem like enough, did it? <laughs> going to play steady. <laughs> I don't know if I could. Just don't want to stop and start Cause I'm steady go, man. Okay. Well, thank you. Huh? <laughs> oh, man, now you're really getting me. Now, now I can't do that on this guitar. I'm sorry. It's the wrong guitar. If she knew what she wants, if she knew what she needs, 
Wish you knew what you want. Wish you knew what you want. I'd be giving it to her. Giving it to her. But she wants everything. For there's nothing she. Crazy for this girl. If she knew what she wants, I'd be giving it to her, giving it to her. I'd say her values aren't corrupted, and she's poor. Satisfied, and next I find her crying. There's nothing she can explain. If she knew what she wants, if she knew what she. She knew what she wants. If she knew what she wants, I'd be giving it to her, giving it to her. There's no sense thinking I could rehabilitate her when she's fine, fine, fine. Got so many ideas juggling around in her head. She doesn't need nothing from mine. Now some have a style. They learn how to read. Walk a crooked line. She would not understand why anyone would have to try to walk a line when they could fly. She knew what she wants. If she knew what she needs. If she knew what she wants. If she knew what she wants, I'd be giving it to her. Giving it to her. But she wants everything. I can't give her everything. She knew what she wants. If she knew what she wants. Thanks a lot. Thank you.
Thanks very much for coming. Appreciate it.